Again, we bid you good morning and happy Sabbath. And we are trusting that you're having a very beautiful Sabbath day. The title of our message today is One More Night with the Frogs. You heard it right. One More Night with the Frogs. And that will make a little more sense to you as we move through the sermon. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible. Exodus chapter 4 will be the chapter for our consideration. And we want to take a look at zero in on verse 21. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. Uh, before I read the word of God, let's talk to the author of the word and ask for his presence and his power. Father God, again, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to open the word of God, to hear from the Lord. Father, speak now to us and through us so that we may hear and understand and put into practice that which we know to be right. For it is in the doing that we are made like Christ Jesus, and we need you to fill our lives and to fix us in the broken areas and draw us closer to you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. One more night with the frogs. I'm in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 21. The Bible says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. This statement about God hardening Pharaoh's heart appears some 18 times in the Word of God. Now, at first glance, God's actions may seem a bit arbitrary, perhaps even a little capricious. Maybe you may even view them as mean-spirited. A superficial reading of these passages might drive us to the impression that sometimes God is less than fair. Satan would want you to think that. I mean, if you look at it as it stands, you give a person a hard heart, and then you punish them for having a hard heart. As a young Christian, I can recall, even up until my college years, in looking at this, this idea confused and irritated me. The idea that that, that, that God would, would, would perform this way, a God of love. I bristled at the idea that God could be this way. I thought, why should I spend time trying to serve a God and cozy up to a God who may one day just decide that he doesn't like me? I mean, you make a man hard and then punish him for being hard-hearted. It seemed a bit non-sequitur. It seemed a bit, a bit cruel and uneven to me, to me. I remember saying to God in college one night when I was wrestling with him, wrestling with the idea of going into ministry or not, I remember saying it just doesn't seem cool, it doesn't seem fair to punish somebody for having a character trait that you gave them. I heard someone years later make a similar remark regarding Judas Iscariot. Uh, they said, you know, somebody has, has had, to, had to betray Christ. It was predicted, prophesied that he would be betrayed. So why should we then be so hard on Judas? Somebody had to do it and the lot just fell on Judas. Well, there's an answer for that too, a very strong biblical response to that that is very fair and very just, and we don't have time to go in, into that just now. But if you read the Word of God, you will find that God always treats mankind fairly. And um, even when man does something uh, less than honorable, God is honorable in his dealings with them. It is true that if we confess our sin, he is always always faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 3, we see it again. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. 
So how then do you harmonize this hardening of the heart with a loving God as portrayed throughout the word of God? They just don't seem to mesh together, and yet they do. First off, when you're dealing with someone, I'm talking about Pharaoh now, when you're dealing with someone who has, shall we say, an extraordinarily high opinion of themselves, their senses are so overmodulated with the sounds of their own self-worth God many times has to resort to rather spectacular measures and methodologies to get their attention. When a person is, uh, as we say, stuck on themselves, it's difficult to get them free. The ancient kings thought of themselves as gods. They held in their hands the fates, the fortunes the, of of empires and and many times they could control large swaths of territory of the world kingdoms men women children and yet had no control of themselves of their own passions of their of their own mindset and we find that in the world today there are so many people who have large fortunes who control multinational corporations who have the fates of nations and countries and companies in their hands and yet fail to control themselves. Uh, we see that in our, our, our world today. So let's take a peek now to try to get an idea of where we're going and what we're talking about. Let's take a peek at some of the personal correspondence of one of these God kings who had such a high uh, opinion of himself. I'm in the book of 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18 we're turning to and uh, let's just take a look at at uh, one of these conversations second kings chapter 18 and we're going to consider verses 30 32 through 30 uh, let's go through 35 32 32 and we'll continue to verse 35 it starts in the middle of, the, uh, of a sentence here, but we want to pick up the thought and then we'll go back and we'll tie this all together. I'm in 2 Kings 18, looking at verse 32. Um, Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain, a land of new wine, uh, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves and honey, that you may live and not die. But do not listen to Hezekiah. Lest he persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Verse 34. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim and Hena and Iva? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? And verse 35. Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Now, these are the words of King Sennacherib of Assyria. Here's what he's saying. It is my intention to come and overtake your kingdom. Look at the history books, he's saying. All of the kingdoms that I have conquered thus far had gods. They had gods that they prayed to. They had gods that they worshipped. When I came to take their kingdoms, they prayed to their gods. But their gods could not stop me. I say, I go where I want. I do what I want. I take what I please. No God has ever stopped me, and your God will not stop me either. Whoever he is, he will have no better success than all of the gods of all of the other countries. So, Sennacherib is saying, basically, I take what I want. I'm coming to get Jerusalem. 
don't believe Hezekiah that your God is any different than any other God. And don't believe anything that the king is trying to tell you. Your God cannot stop me just like the other gods were impotent in trying to stop me. You see, when you wave your finger in the face of God like that, when you challenge and affront God like that, when you compare God to, to other false gods, then God is going to have to respond. So Hezekiah took that Lord, that letter, and he placed it before the Lord and before the priests, and they prayed over that letter. And God had to show Sennacherib that he was not like all of the other impotent false gods. And one night, the Lord sent an angel, and that angel slew 185,000 of his troops. It was one angel. And then Sennacherib returned home, and while he was in his temple, praying to his heathen god, his own two sons struck him down and slew him. We see that in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 37. Now, God didn't make those boys assassinate their father, nor did he stop them from doing so. So, when you call out, as they would say in modern language, when you call out God like that, then God is going to have to respond. And this is the end of the dealings of Sennacherib with the children of Israel. Well, Pharaoh was cut from that same cloth. He thought of himself as a God on earth, willful, belligerent, impudent, and proud. So when Moses said, let my people go, we find Pharaoh's answer, Pharaoh's response, in, the, in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2. Here's his response. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? To let Israel go. I do not know the Lord. Nor will I let Israel go. You see Pharaoh had an attitude problem. He's got an attitude problem when we meet him. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But that's his response. Let my people go. The response. Who is the Lord? That I should let the people go. That I should obey his voice. I am not going to let him go. And I'm not listening to the Lord. See, when you, when you speak like that, you're kind of putting God on notice. You're kind of calling God out. You are asking to be introduced to God. Some of us do it every day in the way we act, in the way we respond to God as Christians. But Pharaoh didn't know God and didn't want to know God. God is going to have to introduce himself to Pharaoh. He's going to have to show him that I am, that I am, is in charge. You see, don't ask God for an introduction unless you're ready for the handshake. And so to really understand the hardening of God, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart by God, we've got to look at the nature of God and the nature of Pharaoh. And there are two ways to, to, to build this, to look at this. What is God like? Well, the text that we all know and love, 1 John 4, 8 in the New Testament, he that does not love, does not know God, the Bible says, for God is love. Now that's a very, very important text, and you've heard this expl ex explanation many times. God does not have love. God does not share love. God does not only give love. He is love. So he does have love. He does share love. He gives love, but the Bible says he is love. 
God has only one weapon, one way, one methodology, one modality of dealing with the human family. That is love. That's his, his modus operandi when it comes to dealing with humans. He always deals with us from a hand of love. Even when he allows punishment to come or actively punishes us, he does so in love. God has one way of dealing with us as human beings. Praise God. Always he deals with love. So when you're going through something that is coming from God, you know that it is a God of love who is allowing you to go through this and he's doing it for your benefit and for uh, your betterment because he loves you. He starts with love. He stays with love. He ends with love. God, Malachi says, cannot lie. Titus tells us he does not change. I mean, you know, being able, being able to lie is a pretty useful tool if you're trying to deceive. Satan has all kinds of deceptive weapons. Uh, he can lie, he can cheat, he can steal, he can embezzle, he can coerce, subversion, perversion, force, ridicule, hate, malice, jealousy, envy, revenge, selfishness, racism, sexism, peer pressure, classism, nationalism. Uh, you know, he's got a lot of tricks up his sleeve. It's, it's very handy to look like a mink when you're really a skunk. <laughs> or to look like a sheep when you're really a wolf. Or to look like a dove when you're really a hawk. Or to look like a goldfish when you're really a piranha. Satan's got all kind of tricks and lies up his sleeve. God has but one. He loves us with an everlasting love that has not changed, is not changing, and will never change because we serve a God that loves us always and forever. Now that's God. And in this corner, now we got man. We got Pharaoh. David says, man born in sin, shaped in iniquity, conceived in sin. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it so we've got on one side a consistent God of love who loves us cares about us treats us with love and can only treat us with love and on this side we've got mankind in this particular incident we're talking about Pharaoh deceitful Cheating, does not own, know or own his own self. Who can know it? And more so, when you're Jehovah God and you're dealing with a man, a king, an emperor, who thinks he's your equal, then you've got some serious problems. Because this king who sits on this throne thinks he is your equal, does not know you, does not respect you. So before God ever said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, when we look at him, when we meet him, his heart is already in jeopardy. And there's a law. We don't have time to go into this too much, but I want to just touch on it. There's a law in the, I call it a law. It's something that, that I found in the, um, in the Bible in, in general, the Old Testament in particular, but it also reveals itself in the New Testament. I call it the law of first mention. The law of first mention. If you want to know the character, the true character, or how the Bible views a particular person, look at the very first time that person is mentioned in the Bible. Look at the very first time he is described. And the Bible will give you, in that first uh, mention of this particular character, whatever character you're studying, it will give you sort of a synopsis of how the Bible views that character, where that character is coming from and where God is coming from in relation to that character. It's very, very interesting. I call it the law of first mention. It is consistent. Look at what the Bible says the first time you meet that person, and then you'll get an idea of where that person is starting from and where the Bible uh, sees him uh, and where heaven is uh, viewing this guy or woman 
and uh, how they're going to proceed from there. So let's look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 19. Exodus 3, verse 19. God says, but I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a mighty hand. So we see it again. God says, I'm sure, I know, I, I, I know this guy. I, I know him and I am sure that he's not going to let the people go. Again, two ways to look at this. All God's got is love. And if love aggravates you, looking at this at a rational, from a rational perspective, if God's love aggravates you, if showing love aggravates you and upsets you, here's the question. What else can God do? He cannot stop loving you. He cannot hate you. He cannot trick or deceive you. All God can do is love you. And if love aggravates you or irritates you, what else can God do but love? Because he doesn't change and he always loves. Do you think that God had never tried to soften Pharaoh's heart before? The first time we meet Pharaoh, in fact, let's, let's go to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. I'll show you something. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 22. Exodus 1, 22. This is one of the early times we are meeting Pharaoh and sort of getting an idea of the kind of person that we're dealing with. Exodus 1, 22. So Pharaoh, I'm reading, reading verse 22. So Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who was born you shall cast in the river and every daughter you shall save alive. Now if you back up in Exodus chapter 1, um, um, you see some other things um, about this. Um, so I'm um, at verse 18. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? Now, the reason he's asking that question is because several verses before he, he put out an edict. If a male child is born, cast him into the river. If a female child is born, um, uh, you can let her live. Now, what is interesting is that the, the midwives who were supposed to carry out this order said, you know, these, these, these Hebrew women, they're not like the Egyptian women. The Egyptian women go into labor and they stay in labor a long time. It gives us a chance to, to, to get there and see if it's a male or a female. But these, these Hebrew women... They have those babies so quick and they're back in the field working. They have them so fast. We don't have a chance to even get there and toss the babies in the, the river because they, they have them and hide them. And we're not able to carry out your commands. But my, my point is, what kind of person gives an order, drown every male child and let the female children live? You see, when we meet Pharaoh, we are introduced to a man whose heart is already in jeopardy. His heart is already hard. When we meet him, he's giving an order for a wholesale genocide of every male child that is Hebrew. So it, it, it takes a hard heart to give an order like that. Uh, and, you know, depending on how entrenched you are, on the throne of your own life, that, that determines the volume God is going to have to use to get your attention. I have found that the Lord we serve speaks just loud enough to get your attention. If you can hear the still, small voice, God will speak to you in a still, small voice. But if you're hard of hearing and need the volume turned up, God will turn up the volume on his activities in your life so that you can hear. 
because God wants you to hear, and he will turn up the volume to the point that you can hear. That's why the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, listen to God. So we're dealing with a hard-headed, hard-hearted man who God is trying to get through to, and the volume is going to have to be pretty high because he is hard of hearing. You follow me? Uh, my mom used to say, if you can't hear, uh, now my mother was one, uh, she was Canadian, and they have a lot of sayings, a lot of uh, British background, she, a lot of sayings. She used to tell us, you know, if you can't hear, feel. Now that was her saying, basically, that um, <laughs> the strap is coming out, and it's going to be a day of reckoning. So if you can't hear, feel. Um, you know, the, these, these kinds of statements that... that um, uh, we hear so often and often. And, and since Pharaoh could not hear, he and all of Egypt were going to have to feel. The ten plagues that we read about in Exodus were targeted to the gods of the Egyptians. God punished Pharaoh, but he wanted Pharaoh and all of Egypt to understand a number of things, and I'm going to give them to you. Here's what God was trying to get through to Pharaoh. One, there is only one true God. He wanted Pharaoh to know that and to understand that. Two, there, that one God has no equal and certainly no superior. See, these plagues were an attempt to get Pharaoh to understand to not to stop listening to the sound of his own voice and listen to what the God of the Hebrews was trying to tell him. One, there's only one true God. Two, that one true God has no equal and no superior. Three, that God demands and deserves worship. God demands it. God deserves it. True worship. Four, this God has all power. Regardless of who you're worshiping, who you're buying down to, this God, God of the Hebrews, has all power. Number five, it grows out of number four. Your gods are not gods. These carvings, these statues, these natural phenomena that you worship, they're not God. They're not true gods. Six, your gods have no power, not in the face of the one true God. They have no power. Number seven, when God speaks, you must obey. When this God of the Hebrew speaks, you must obey. Now again, these are the things that God is trying to teach Pharaoh and the Egyptian nation. Number eight, when you obey, things go good. You know, God had to labor with the Hebrews for many, many years to try to teach them that also. That when you obey, things go good. When you disobey, things go bad. It's not rocket science. Obey and live, disobey and die. So when you obey, things go well. When you disobey, things don't go so well. And number 10, God takes care of his own. Ultimately, God had to show Pharaoh, I take care of my people. So let's run through them very quickly. One, only one God. Two, God has no equal, no superior. Three, God demands true worship. Four, God has all power. Five, God, your gods are not real gods. Six, your God has no power. Seven, when God speaks, you must obey. Eight, uh, when you obey, things go good. When you disobey, things go bad. And uh, that was nine. And then number 10, God takes care of his own. So God in those plagues, in his dealing with Pharaoh and with all of Egypt, was, was trying to teach them lessons that they needed to know. These are the same lessons 
that Jesus would have us learn some 3,300 years later. Things have not changed. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one true God. That hasn't changed. Ladies and gentlemen, that one God has no equal and no superior. The God that we serve, Jehovah God, our God, nothing like him and certainly nothing better than him. Three, God demands and deserves worship. We ought to worship God. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. Nothing has changed. Number four, the God that we serve has all power. Number five, other gods are not gods. There is no other God like our Jehovah God. Amen and amen. They have no power. Number seven, when God speaks, we must obey. I've learned that through the years, and I suspect you have too if you've served God long enough. When God speaks, you have to listen. You must obey. Eight, when you obey, things go well. Praise God. When you listen to God, when you follow God, when you accept what God has for your life, when you let God lead out and you humbly follow, things are going to go good. But when you disobey, you may succeed for a while, but ultimately disobedience has its cost. Things go bad. And number 10, I'm a living witness. God takes care of his own. So the lesson that God was trying to teach 3,300 years plus years ago, things haven't changed. God is still trying to teach hard-headed humans those same lessons today. Ten things that we ought to know and that we ought to follow. First Samuel chapter 15 verse 22, God said to King Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. God wants and deserves, brothers and sisters, our loyalty, our obedience. It's just in your own self-interest to obey God. I tell my young people, God's been doing this God thing for a long time. And you know what? He's pretty good at it. He does it well. So when you obey him, success is the default position. Things are going to go well when you follow God. And even when times get tough, you have the assurance that God is with you and that you are not fighting by yourself. It's all about making the decision to follow God. And so Pharaoh said, no, I don't care who your God is. I'm not giving you a day off. I'm not letting you go into the desert and worship God in the country. Moreover, you know the story. I'm increasing your tally of bricks. You need to make bricks. We are not going to supply straw for you anymore. And you better not come short one brick. So the Bible says he made the people serve with rigor. Now rigor is not a term that we use much anymore, but suffice it to say, one of the things that Moses told the children of Israel, when you get into the land and you have slaves and you have people working for you, don't ever make them serve with rigor. So that's something I don't want to see my people ever performing on their servants and their slaves. So God, through Moses and Aram, began to dismantle the Egyptian economy and also their idolatrous practices. You see, these plagues were not randomly selected. The plagues were aimed at, focused on, not only the things that the Egyptians worshipped, but also, in many instances, staples of their economy. So God began with the plagues now to dismantle their worship practices and also to disassemble the Egyptian economy. So there was a spiritual aspect to the plagues, but there was also a financial or physical aspect to the plagues. And God focused on those things 
to let them know that he was controlled. Isn't in control. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting how when matters come that dig into your pocketbook, they immediately get your attention. Such is with this coronavirus situation that we are dealing with. Now, there is this tension between the scientific community, uh, the scientific slash medical community, and Wall Street or the financial community. One says we need to keep our foot on the brake a little longer. Others say it's time to get off the brake and get on the accelerator. And there is tension there because um, if we move too fast, we set ourselves back. If we don't move fast enough, we do what some say is irreparable financial harm. So there's always this tension. And it was the same way in Egypt. God's now dealing with Egypt by bringing these plagues is, is hurting them financially, but it's also uh, dismantling their, their spiritual economy and the things that they worship. For instance, uh, they worship the Nile. God turned the Nile to blood choked it with stinking fish. So the worship of the Nile was impacted. Also, the economy was impacted because they couldn't fish anymore. Um, lice, more accurately, scholars believe, stinging gnats or, or some sort of tick. Again, interestingly enough, they, they worshiped them and uh, there was a plague of them. They crept into the eyes, the nose, um, I read some information just fairly recently about the Egyptian dog fly, um, which was uh, part, of, part of the plagues also. They say that the, the Egyptian dog fly in particular, when it's enraged or agitated, it acts more like a bee. And scholars say um, that uh, when the Egyptian dog fly bites or stings, it, it, it kind of it responds like, like, a, like a bee sting or, or like what we have in, in Long Island, New York, when growing up, uh, when I was pastoring there, um, out on the beach, you have these sand flies that, that come in and sting and they really leave a, a quite a sharp little sting. Well, the, the Egyptian dog fly, they say, is like that. And interestingly enough, I'll tell you this, um, if you look at Egyptian hieroglyphics and their, and their writings uh, and their pictographs, you notice a uh, heavy black eyeliner across the eyes and right along here, the eye up and down, you see this heavy black dog, uh, heavy black eyeliner. There are some scholars who say that that was not just a fashion statement. It was put there to ward off the attacks of this dog fly, which would fly into your eyes. And it, it, it was, it was a, a way of, for men and women to sort of keep back this Egyptian dog fly. So again, one of the plagues, um, uh, that uh, God was trying to get through to Pharaoh and to get his attention. Cattle, very important. The de diseases of uh, the cattle. Boils, um, hail mixed with fire, locusts, darkness, and finally death. So each plague attacked another aspect of the Egyptian economy and also attacked another aspect of the Egyptian worship system. And God was trying to let them know that these things that you put so much power in, so much stock in, that you trust in so much are not going to save you, are not going to keep you because you are now in the presence of the God of gods, the I am that I am, the one who is in control. In Ezekiel, um, the Bible says, I have, Ezekiel 18, uh, 32, God is saying, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked saith the Lord, therefore turn and live. So God was not getting any pleasure out of punishing Pharaoh and punishing Egypt. But Pharaoh's heart was hard. His knee ears needed to be opened. And the Egyptian people needed to know who God was. Uh, God doesn't get any pleasure, pleasure in seeing us suffer. I want you to know that. Satan is the author of that. The enemy is the offer of that. He gets pleasure watching you suffer. God does not. God wants his people to live, to live abundantly. But sometimes when you put yourself against God, when you array yourself against God and put yourself outside of the protection, the safety of God, the default setting on your life is going to be suffering. Again, if you obey, things go good. If you don't obey, 
things go bad. So now this nation is absorbing unprecedented catastrophe because of Pharaoh's intransigence, his insubordination. He simply will not listen. His heart, instead of getting soft and pliable, gets hard. And he would beg for forgiveness and beg for the, the, the place to be removed. But then the hardness, the pride would reassert itself as it does in so many of our lives. And uh, he would go back until another plague has come. It seems rather strange, um, given this, to look at Pharaoh's response. Go with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 8. Look at verses 8. Let's start with verses 8. And maybe we'll read to the beginning of 10. Here we go. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may sacrifice to the Lord. Of course, they had heard that before. And Moses said to Pharaoh, accept the honor, and, and, and watch this interplay. Moses said to Pharaoh, accept the honor of saying, when I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people, to destroy the frogs from you and your houses, that they may remain in the river only. So he said, that is Pharaoh, tomorrow. Now let's stop there. Doesn't it seem odd? The plague, as described in um, Exodus chapter 8, is a plague of frogs that are literally everywhere. If you start with your reading at verse 2, and we see frogs are abundant. They're everywhere. Um, Big frogs, small frogs, slimy frogs, green frogs, sticky, smelly frogs. Everywhere you turn, when you pull down the covers at night, you've got frogs there. Frogs, your life is surrounded by frogs. You, you can't sleep for frogs. When you step out of your bed at night, you're stepping on frogs. You cannot move for frogs. They're in every crack and crevice and corner of your house. And this plague is so, so complete and so replete there's there's no rest there's no respite there's no way to get away from them there's just frogs everywhere you turn you you put your foot in your shoe in the morning to to go out to do your work and there's frogs in your shoes everywhere you turn you cannot get rest they're creeping they're croaking there we have these frogs out there where Irma and I are, uh, there's a large pond there, and we hear these big bullfrogs, and you can hear them at night. They are quite loud. They, they almost sound like a small dog. They're just big and belly. So just, you've got big frogs and small frogs, and in, in uh, Puerto Rico and in some of the islands, you have this little coquille, which is a little tiny frog with a very big mouth and a lot of noise, and it makes this noise that, that they keep up from sundown till sunup. All night long, you get this, this frogs, frogs. So imagine in your mind, frogs everywhere, frogs, frogs, frogs. You cannot get away from them. They're everywhere you turn. There, there are frogs. Now, even if you're some sort of ersatz earth person and 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 you like frogs and you think a little tiny frog is cute, that may be true. A little frog, one little frog may be cute, but I guarantee you, one billion frogs are not. And so there is this plague of frogs. You cannot get away from them. They are literally covering every inch of earth that exists. And so God says to Moses, tell Moses, or rather Moses, tell Pharaoh, I'm going to give you the privilege and pleasure of saying what time you want the frogs to disappear from your country. Now, turn on your, your minds for just a second and, and ask yourself, what would you say to that question? What would be your answer? 
I know what mine would be. Mine would be right now, immediately, yesterday if possible. But look at Pharaoh's answer in verse 10 of chapter, of, of chapter 8. And he, that is Pharaoh, said, tomorrow. Oh, isn't that interesting? You've got this plague of frogs. You have Hecate, the frog-headed goddess of Egypt. That's who, who God is attacking, this worship of, of frogs. And they've overrun your country. And God says, what time do you want them gone? And Pharaoh says, tomorrow. In other words, he's asking for, he's settling for one more night with the frogs. He could have them gone now. He could have said, make them go immediately. But he says, no, make them go tomorrow. One more night with the frogs. Why would anyone want to spend one more night with the frogs? Why not get rid of them now? Now, interestingly enough, Ellen White says in discussing this, he was trying to give his magicians time to see if they could do something. So he was willing to take the risk of spending one more night with the frogs just to see if his soothsayers and his magicians and his astrologers could match up against God and get rid of them themselves. But of course, we know that that was not possible. Because there is only one God who has all power. And the Egyptian gods had no power. But I want to change gears for just a second. Because back in the spring of 1974, a 19-year-old heiress, an espoused dilettante, her name was Patty Hearst. She was kidnapped by the self-styled field marshal, Sinke and Tume, and members of what was then called the Libyanese, Sim, the, the Symbionese Liberation Army. The Symbionese Liberation Army. Now, these were a bunch of anarchists, I guess is the best way you could put it. And Patty Hearst was kidnapped from the University of California at Berkeley. The negotiated sum for her release was $4 million. That ransom was not paid, and for two months, nothing was heard about Patty Hearst. In April of 1974, the SLA, the Symbionese Liberation Army, struck again. This time, robbing and shooting two customers at the Hibernia Bank in San Francisco, California. Now, caught on the bank's video surveillance footage was an image of a young woman holding a rifle. She was part of the gang, part of the stick-up. That person turned out to be the same Patty Hearst. She had allegedly joined this Symbionese Liberation Army and was now calling herself Tanya. At her subsequent arrest and trial, psychologists said that Patty Hearst was suffering from something that they called Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a phenomenon that, that takes place when a hostage, through contact, manipulation, and coercion with her captors, or his captors, so identifies himself or herself with the aims, objectives, 
goals of the captors that the captive convinces his or herself that the captors cause is right and they should embrace it and align themselves with it. In other words, Stockholm Syndrome is simply a person is kidnapped by a group of people who are their enemies. But through association with those enemies, they actually adopt the aims, the objectives of the enemies and become one with them in mindset. Now this term, which was then a recently adopted term had just come into our, our lexicon. The term comes from an incident in 1973 when a number of people were held captive in Stockholm, Sweden. After just six days, less than one week, when help came, when help arrived, when help showed up to free the captives, the captives actually resisted the help and the freedom, choosing rather to stay with the captors or kidnappers. That was the first recorded incident of Stockholm Syndrome. Now, how does this apply to what we are talking about and what we are dealing with today? It occurs to me that we can live so long in sin that it loses its sinful nature. And that's one of the things that we find salient in our world today. This, this identification with sin, this mind meld, as it were, with sin, to the point that sin simply does not appear as sinful as it is and as God sees it. The truth is, brothers and sisters, almost any habit indulged in long enough can become part of us. We as human beings can get so comfortable in sin, so accustomed to sin, so at peace with sin, that not only do we not hate it, it loses its sinfulness and becomes desirable to us. That is why preachers have to preach so hard and Christians have to fight constantly against sin because there is always the danger that we become acclimatized to sin. Sin becomes the new normal. We accept sin. We don't see it as sinful and we don't hate it and it loses its sinfulness. Sin, ladies and gentlemen, can actually become something we cannot live without because of our continued familiarization with it and fraternization with sin. It loses its sinfulness. My mind flashes back to a certain serial killer. I was looking at some papers just the other day. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, one of the most notorious serial killers in the history of this country. Many people don't know that Jeffrey Dahmer not only raped and murdered many of his victims, and this is a little gory, but I, I will say it because it's the truth. He actually consumed part of his victims. He was guilty of cannibalism and necrophilia. You may say, how can someone become that depraved? Well, the more you deal in sin and spend time indulging sin, sin moves from an indulgence to becoming your master. 
one of Jeffrey Dahmer's almost victims was a former Seventh-day Adventist, and I've read this story many times, and it was his Seventh-day Adventist training that saved him. Uh, he was out just running around, hanging out. He met Jeffrey Dahmer in a park, and uh, they became friends, and uh, Jeffrey Dahmer invited him over to his house for a drink. Now, this person didn't serve God at that time, but his training, where he didn't drink alcohol, he didn't drink coffee, he didn't eat or drink any number of negative things, came into good stead. So when um, Jeffrey Drama began to spike his soda with alcohol, he immediately felt the taste, or he tasted it, and he stopped drinking it. That alcohol was used to cover the taste of the, the poison that was laced inside of the drink. And the only reason the young man stopped is because even though he wasn't serving the Lord, he wasn't following the dictates of God, he remembered that as a child, his mom forbade him to drink alcohol, and he stopped. So his life was saved because of his home training. He stumbled, he fell, but he fought off Jeffrey Dahmer and managed to escape and run to the police, and his Adventist training saved his life, even though he had long since turned his back on the Lord. And so you ask questions, how can people like Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot or Idi Amin or uh, Milosevic or, or any number of men and some women slaughter millions of people and not bat an eye? The answer is sin. Sin is not cute. Sin is not easy. Sin is not hip. Sin is not cool. Sin is not chic. Sin is Apollyon. It is a destroyer. Sin is death. So why would anyone want to spend one more night in sin? Why would anyone want to spend one more night with the frogs? I've talked to smokers who coughed the f or, and or threw up the first time they puffed on a cigarette. Years later, they are so hooked on alcohol and tobacco that even as they pray for deliverance, they don't believe they can get deliverance. That's what sin does. I had a prostitute come to a prayer meeting and admit, and this is shocking, she said to my prayer meeting group that she had been with over 5,000 males. Um, I had a young woman admit to my prayer group that she had had a dozen abortions. I had a woman walk into that prayer meeting. We had a prayer meeting at my church. Um, it was called the, the No Condemnation Prayer Meeting. Uh, the rules were you could come in and say anything you want about your life, about anything that was bothering you, and no one would condemn you. It was just open season. Nobody would condemn. Nobody would say, oh, my goodness, you bad person. We would just tell the truth, and then we would pray. And we had many people bring some very strong testimonies. I had a woman walk in. She was 90 pounds, five foot seven, 90 pounds, addicted to crack cocaine. Uh, she didn't know the first time that someone gave her crack that it would lock her down for many, many years and that she would not be able to give it up. All of these young girls, 5,000 Johns, 12 abortions, um, just horrendous situations. But do you not know that these three in particular all gave their hearts to the Lord, all got clean, all got baptized, all became outstanding citizens of the kingdom of God and gave their hearts to to the Lord and walked with him. And when I left the church, that church, they were still functioning in the church 
and serving the Lord. Why? Because they determine, I'm not going to spend not one more night with the frauds. I'm not going to spend one more night with sin. I'm not going to spend one more uh, hour fighting against God. I'm going to surrender myself to him. I'm going to get deliverance. And I'm going to stand with my Jesus. Why would anyone spend one more night with the frogs when freedom from sin is offered? You know, uh, I have a friend uh, pastoring in New York City still. Uh, he has a statement that he, he says often. I, I, I like it. He says, I've seen God do so much with so little for so long that I'm now convinced that God can do anything with nothing. And I like that. God can do anything with nothing. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, He that cometh unto me must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder. When you come to Jesus, when you bring your heart to him in humility, in submission, he will reward your search by giving you a brand new life. That prostitute became a, a youth leader. I've got to say that 90 pound smoker uh, went up to about 150 pounds. She, she gave up the crack and, and got stuck on ice cream. But I, I, I like ice cream a lot better than crack. And uh, it, uh, you can do a little better with that than you can with, with, with crack. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 48, 11, we don't have time to change to turn to that. You, you see God's complaint against Moab. Moab's problem was he never grew. He never changed. He never got the victory. He never advanced. He didn't move from vessel to vessel or from grace to grace or from strength to strength or from victory to victory. He stayed and sat down in his sin. That's not what God wants, to, uh, wants you to go through and wants for your life. He wants you to be victorious. Don't spend one more night with the frogs, not one more second in sin. Surrender to him today. And as the Bible so plainly states, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that we can be doers of your word, hearers of your word, understanders of your word, indeed practitioners of your word. Oh, dear Father, as we leave this place and go throughout our daily routines, may this word stay in our heart. May it soften our hearts. May it open up our hearts to do more for you. And may our head follow the leadings of our heart as we seek to serve you faithfully day by day. Bless us, Lord, one and all. Keep us in thy loving care. Share your love with us so that we can share it with others. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.